So last week, James cut us pretty deeply, didn't he? Right? But it was for good reason, right? It was needed surgery, right? That he could just expose really the depths of our sin so that he could then pour in more grace. Remember that, right? So we could have the joy of really knowing that his mercy is more. Now in this section, he's going to warn us of the disconnect that can actually start to happen uh, between our professed faith in Jesus and the gospel and the life that we actually live in the every day, right? Where we can start to live as if God is not real, or at least he's maybe not really needed in any meaningful way. And, and the worst thing of all is that sometimes we don't even seem to be bothered by the disconnect. Well, James wants to bother us, right? What a good and faithful friend he is, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. So here's our scripture as we continue where we left off in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. You can follow along in your Bible or your app. It'll also be on the screen for you. Reading from James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Okay, there's our passage. Now who here, who's our meticulous careful, organized, detailed planners. You know, you've got every detail needs to be organized and planned out. Who are you? There you are. Who's our more, um, you know, spontaneous brothers and sisters? I guess we could say, um, you wouldn't know neat and organized if it hit you right in the face. Okay, there you are. And the rest of you are kind of on the spectrum, right? Somewhere in be between there. Well, but we all do make plans of varying degrees, right? And the, the Bible is definitely not anti-planning. In fact, planning is encouraged, as you can even see by the verse, hopefully that's up on the screen from Proverbs. The Bible is actually pro-planning. It's good to have a schedule, have things organized in advance. I mean, that's how you got here on time, right? Congratulations. You had a plan and you executed it. Or maybe you just came in in the arms of someone who is a planner and you got here. But if we're wise, James has been telling us that our plans need to humbly line up with God's priorities. They need to be implemented with God's character, of humility and grace, and they need to be motivated really by a genuine love for others. So he's been emphasizing that. And he's warning us of the great danger and tendency of many people who say, I believe in Jesus for my salvation, but then for all practical purposes, live as if God doesn't exist. As if our life is our own to do with what we want where a person actually says to God, you know, no, no, this is mine, right? I give you your time on Sunday, right? That'd be like your spouse saying to you, uh, this isn't date night, so leave me alone, right? If we don't bring God into all of life as God, then practically we are living like atheists, and so you might want to find it helpful if you do have access to the take-home sheet. It would be on, on the, the hub. It'll be posted as well uh, later on on the website. Uh, there is an outline there. And so because of all we're going to kind of walk through, you, you may some of you may find that helpful. Some of you aren't organized enough for that. So you, won't, you can just wing it and go along with it. But we begin then in verse 13 where he says, Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. So James is trying to get us to consider what's actually driving our plans. What does it show what we really believe? And so in this verse, what is behind the plan to move to such and such a town? 
What is it? Profit, money, right? So make some, make some more money, right? And so when our plans, when our focus is on earthly security, which is an illusion, by the way, right? If COVID taught us anything, it should teach us that that's an illusion. Earthly security is unstable ground. But when Jesus is our security, which is what James is trying to push us to, then we can actually focus on his priorities for us. And then we can rest and trust in whatever he's got in store, right? Even as Joseph had to do well in, in Egypt. And even though we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And to those of us who claim to have trusted the Lord for salvation, James is asking, has your belief in Jesus actually transformed your decision-making process? Has it transformed what you actually live for? Does your belief include what he says in the scripture about our mission and stewarding our time and our resources, our gifts, our money for that mission? Does it include what God says about relationships and sex and living together and marriage? Does it include what God says about the church that Jesus died to create? Does it line up your priorities with his priorities? Your will submitted to his will where we actually do what God says is right as what verse 17 really says. Or do you have all your reasons and justifications for why right now you can't actually do what God says is right? If Jesus doesn't have the authority to speak into every area of our life, then what does that say about your faith in him as Lord? When we forget God, in fact, let's say you go about your day and, and, and God really doesn't even come to mind. We're living then as if there is no God, as if he doesn't exist and as if we're not dependent upon him, as if the Lord Jesus has not actually instructed us what is good and what is evil and how we're to live. Instead, we're living as if we are the highest authority to decide what's good and evil, to decide what's right and wrong for ourselves. And it sounds like something the serpent said in the garden, right? In Genesis 3, right? So he says in verse 13, come now, right? You can just see him almost like Paul, he said this, come now, let's reason together, right? So come now, let's reason together. He's getting to the idea. You who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. So there's a lot of presumption there. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. So he's reminding us we are very limited in our knowledge and control. And James actually being really gracious here, I think, when he says we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Because the truth is, I don't know what today will bring. Right? And so who back here in January, when you were making your resolutions, when you were making your plans, you know, for summer 2020, right? How many of you foresaw 2020 as it unfolded? Because, yeah, it wasn't even close, right? And if it was, well, good. I want to talk to you about 2021. So, but life can change in a moment, right? One phone call can change everything. Everything you had planned for that day, a phone call can change it. What is your life, he then goes on to say. And that's the key question. What is your life? James wants us to make no mistake here. He says, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So now do you want to boast and swagger after hearing that? Right? Sounds like we're limited and finite creatures. He says in verse 15, instead, you ought to say, in other words, here's what's right. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So he's even suggesting that sometimes we really are seeking our will and not God's will. I mean, well, of course, because my plans are awesome, right? But it's that lack of humility, right, that sees life as a right instead of a daily mercy. 
It's that pride that can't accept that maybe what I'm thinking is actually wrong, or maybe I've actually misinterpreted what God was communicating, or that self-confidence that even leaves God out of the picture altogether as if God is a mist. If we forget God, if we leave him out of the picture, then we're either going to be anxious or you're going to be arrogant. We've got a plan, but we're not ultimately in control. We're not sovereign, and so that makes us insecure, right? If we don't trust the heart of God, if we're not surrendered and trust God's heart and his will, you see, if I consider most of my plans, it never includes suffering or inconvenience, at least not mine. But that's not my guarantee, right? I receive today not by right, but as a gift from God given to me to steward for him, the one to whom I belong, right? Is that how you answer what is your life? We live in total dependence on God. And yet we can start compartmentalizing our life into sacred and secular as if God is involved here. He cares about what we're doing here in this church gathering, right? But as if he's not involved in the details of my life the rest of the week. That's living functionally as an atheist. That's living, like he said last week, as a murderer who basically cuts God out of our life as if he doesn't exist, as if he doesn't matter. Or it's living as if he's got no claim on me, that I'm my own. It's living as an adulterer, a friend of the world, keeping my independence. It's living as a treasonous judge who sits in judgment over God and his law of love, ignoring what he says is the right thing to do. So to forget God to not be mindful of him and his will for me, he says, is wicked. You can see that in Psalm 9, 17, should be on the, on the screen. See, the truth is, though, we always remember what's important to us. You don't forget what's really important to you. I, I've done a lot of weddings, and I have never seen a bride come down the aisle and suddenly panic and go, oh, I forgot to put my makeup on. Did I do my hair? Like, never. Because it is important to her to look as beautiful as she can on that day. You just don't forget what's most important to you. So what's that say if we go through most of our day and God doesn't even come into our thoughts? We don't even think about him. We don't want to admit it, but it's because he's just not that important to you. He's just not important to you. He's not your first or preeminent love. And this is what the wicked do. They forget God. It's to live as if you don't need God. It's to live as if God is not clearly communicated to us and spoken to us in this book and in the person of Jesus. And so we step in and then we assume the place of God in our life and in the world. So James says, make plans, set a budget, make a schedule, but do so in communion with God. And even then, he says, it's if the Lord wills. Now, we don't say Lord willing just as a cliche, but as a conviction, right? We hold all our plans in an open hand, right? We write them in pencil. My stability, though, is in God's sovereign plan, not in my plan. Because my plans, right, they're short-sighted. They, you know, they have to change. But I'm secure in the God who does not change and who is in ultimate control. And you know what? I think it's really good news that I'm not in control. It's certainly good news for you, right? That I'm, it's good news though that I'm not my own. It's good news that it doesn't rely on my wisdom, my strength. The weight and pressure of the world then is off my shoulders. And I'm just called to be faithful to God's wisdom and directions and just trust and rest in him with the results. See, I'm not designed to carry a lot of what I try to carry. 
But God, he can hold the weight of the world. And he's all wise and he is all good. See, I think what it gets down to a lot of the time, we're not satisfied to be human. Right? Because humans, we have limits. We're dependent on God. But you see, we would rather be in control. And so we can start to live and to plan as if we're not dependent. We can start to live and plan as if our life belongs to me. As if it's my right to do with my life as I want and when I want. Right? I don't like being the clay. I want to be the potter. Take a breath. If you recognize that was a gift of God, it wasn't promised to you. It was gifted to you in grace. And that breath actually came at a great expense. The life of God's own son who died on a bloody, rugged cross that breath you just took and the one you took again was a blood-bought gift. Because you'll view life differently if you really believe it. You'll view life differently when you recognize, too, that this life is brief. Right? If you're following along the outline and take-home sheet, you can see where we are. We're at second point under point two. Right? Life is brief. And... and uh, Here's where he says it, right? Verse 14 again. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So one thing about life under the sun, right, is that it is brief. If you were here for our series in Ecclesiastes, you might remember the Hebrew word that keeps getting repeated there. What was it? Hevel. And what did that word mean? Like vapor, you can't grab hold of it, right? You can't hang on to it. It's, it's, uh, it's vapor just here, here now and just gone in a moment, right? So a mist is fragile, even less fragile than the fog that rolled in, right? Because the fog rings, it can hang over. When we were in Victoria, Cheryl and I, the, the fog would roll in off the ocean and it would just hang over the, the part of the harbor and the area for hours and hours. No, he doesn't use that word. He uses the word mist. So it's much more like vaping, right? You, you just, this mist, you can't grab hold of it. You can't hang on to it, right? So that's not, doesn't give you a lot of place to be in a position to boast and swagger. But God, on the other hand, he is not a mist, right? You know, when you're young, doesn't, doesn't a year seem like a long time? Especially like when you're waiting for Christmas or you're waiting to get your driver's license or whatever it is, right? But the funny thing, as you get older, time goes faster. I know a minute is still a minute, an hour is still an hour, a year is still 365 days unless it's a leap year, right? But I'm telling you, it actually goes faster when you're older. And you just have to wait and see if you don't believe me. And death is coming for all of us. It isn't just old people who die. In fact, those of you who sort of follow along Tim Challies and his blog, you know it was just a, a couple of weeks ago, right? His son, age 20, at Bible college, playing a game outside with his fiance, his sister, and, and other friends, and he just keeled over, dead, age 20. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Just a bit part for a brief scene in the story. We are not the main character. Jesus is. And that's why you want to be connected to Jesus. Though life is a vapor, he is not saying it doesn't matter. Our lives do matter. So he's not trying to discourage us to say, oh, it's just a vapor, so it just doesn't matter. No, what he's actually trying to do is encourage us to redeem the time and to line up our priorities with what God actually tells us is most important. The things that will last for eternity, the things that will not vanish and fade away. He wants us to put our feet where it's eternally stable. And so that's why we say, if the Lord wills. And we don't say it reluctantly, right? 
but it's, we say it with that belief that he actually has our best in mind, right? It's the posture of this humble submission James has been calling us to, this faith that actually trusts the heart of God that he knows what he's doing, that he's not only sovereign, but he is good and wise, and he's working all things, all things together for our ultimate good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, this is not saying you need to tag that on everything you say, right? I'll finish this sermon soon, Lord willing, right? Or I guess we could meet up for lunch tomorrow, Lord willing, if I don't die first, you know, or... Yeah, this right here on this pack you got on your back there, this is the ripcord. And once you jump out of the plane, I want you to count to 20, and then you pull that cord, and the chute will open, if the Lord wills. Right? You, you don't have to tack it on, on everything, but it, it is fine to say it. Maybe we should probably say it more often than we do, because it is good reminder of the truth. But God is mostly concerned with our heart position our heart posture, that God and his will is actually at the forefront of all that we do, and it shows for us our faith that we trust him. And since he went to the extent of dying on the cross in pain and humiliation for us, then I think he can be uh, trusted with the details of my situation, my future, and whatever else I might be tempted uh, to be anxious over and to be in fear about. If the Lord wills, should be the constant refrain of our heart in just every plan, every desire, every prayer. So that all of our plans then get driven by, are fueled by the greater reality that we've got a sovereign king of glory who owns us. Who has ultimately a bigger and better plan than we could have come up with or ever imagined. And because we know his plan includes a cross and a resurrection, we know it's good. So when you're doubting everything else, just remember, his plan included the cross and a resurrection. So this is going to be good. We can't control the future, right? None of us know how much time we have, right? But what we can control, James is emphasizing, are the decisions we make right now. You can't fix what you did before. You can't fix what you did yesterday. But you can change what you do right this moment. And that's why verse 17 is so important. And he tells us this. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. If you know the right thing to do, and where do we get that knowledge? Yeah, it's right here as God has instructed us in his word, in and through, it comes to us in and through Jesus. And if you're not doing that, it is sin. It is murder. It is adultery. It is usurping God's throne. It's not being satisfied with being a human who's loved and exalted by God. It's seeking to be God. So I need to do what the God who owns me The God who bought me says is a priority. That's the right thing to do. When I very first became a a Christian, there was a a farmer in this small little church, and he had become a believer about a year or two before I did. And as as he started to read the Bible, he started to learn then what to get his thinking changed and lining up with the heart of God and his priorities. And he saw the priority that God had for our gathering together as the church and, and, and loving and caring for, for one another in this mutual relationship of, of making disciples, as per Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, right? And then he saw in Acts 2.42, he saw the example of this command being lived out in the, in the early church who were devoted to regularly gathering together to, to hear the, the word of God and learn for that teaching, for the fellowship, to pray together, to, to remember Jesus in the communion meal together and partner with him on this disciple-making mission that where you have this mutual encouraging one another. And so since he knew now from the scriptures what was right, this actually became his priority. And to fail to do it, 
he saw would be sin against his Lord, who loved him and had given himself for him. He knew what Jesus said was right, and so what he began to do was to devote himself to doing it. Now, he had a family, and sometimes they'd go, if they were away in the weekend camping or sometimes visiting family or relatives, they actually determined that they were going to come home Saturday night or get up really early Sunday morning so that they wouldn't miss a gathering and giving the encouragement that the new believers like me needed. Because he went, we've got a number of new believers here, and they need that encouragement. And so for the sake of me, for the sake of some of the other new believers, they adjusted their whole calendar and schedule for us. And he was devoted then to my growth and my encouragement. And I realized that this life in this, this church as a brand new baby believer, that I don't think I'd be here today. I know I wouldn't be who I was today, but for that kind of love and care and equipping and encouragement that I received so early on. And so I am thankful to God for, for those individuals who really focused on the others in the church. They learned what was right, and he did it. And not simply for himself, but it was for the rest of us, right? For our good. I was important to them in this early church family, and they became really important to me. Now, some called him a legalist. But you know what he, how he responded to being called a legalist? He said, it's commanded by Jesus, the one I love. I trust him. Jesus made it clear this is right. That's why I'm devoted to do this, right? I just want to please him. I want to obediently do what he calls me to with joy. After all, look at how he loved me. Look at how he inconvenienced and bent his whole life towards rescuing and loving me. He was focused on doing the right thing as defined by God in the scriptures. Right? So how do we determine our priorities? How do we determine what we should be doing? Now, we don't want to have false guilt begin to develop either, right? Because there are times, right, you're going to miss gatherings, right? It can be a person's calling, can be your vocation, um, it could be your health, it could be a life situation, may mean missing a number of gatherings. And for those individuals, though, it just means it's going to have to, you're going to have to work out some ways with the Lord with extra effort for how you're going to um, connect and be connected, to love the family. It really comes down to our heart direction, our heart direction, so that we get to the place where, hey, if I'm, if I'm away on a Sunday, I miss you guys. Like, I miss being here. My heart direction is still here because you're important to me. Now, I have heard uh, people say this. I've heard people say, well, we won't be around over the summer because we're going to be camping a lot. But I go, since when is camping commanded by Jesus? And gathering with the church that we are to be devoted to, how does that become the optional thing? So why does the command of Jesus, why is that the command that gets bumped? How is that right? right? Now, I do think it's right to make memories with the family. I do think it's, it's, it's right. And summer is a great time for that. And camping is a great way to do that. But every Sunday... Every Sunday gathering for two months? Aren't you being a legalist, Murray? You're starting to sound like a legalist. Well, the truth is, I think there's a lot of confusion about legalism and joyful, willing obedience that actually comes from a love relationship. You see, let's get legalism defined rightly. Legalism is when you're trying to earn God's favor. 
You're trying to gain his blessing through our doing. Or you're trying to keep his anger at bay by your doing. Legalism should never be confused with obedience. Obedience flows out of the gospel. It flows out of our our love for our Father, trusting His wisdom, delighting in His ways, and out of the new heart that He gives us that actually loves other people and esteems them more than ourselves. So as followers of Jesus, we start with the Scripture to see what He commands for us as His people, and those things that the Lord calls us to, that's our highest priority. And there's so many other urgent things vying for our time, pressures from people, expectations, our own fleshly desires, our passions within us. But Jesus' priority is his church. That's his forever family. People are what's going to go on. And this is where he's placed his name. He died on the cross to create his body as his presence on earth. And he wants us to be formed together as one to image forth the God who is this self-giving community, triune community of love. And he wants us to do that through our committed, joy-filled love to one another. He wants us to gather both to give and receive for our own growth and maturity, for, for our brothers and sisters' sake, Right to whom we're called to love as family, for their encouragement, for their building up. Uh, um, I remember when we moved to a new city, a new place, and we were trying to find a church family to, to be a part of, right? that we could be devoted to, and who would be devoted to us, and, and they would encourage us, and we could hopefully use our gifts to encourage them and build them up and point them to Jesus as well. And I remember the first Sunday we went to this one local church, and we connected with this couple, and we really connected well. And so the next Sunday, I was looking forward to seeing them again and meeting some new people. And the next Sunday, we went gathered, and that couple wasn't there. So we did connect with another couple, and we connected well with them. And, and when we looked forward on the third Sunday, we were coming back to build back up, and the first couple wasn't there, and the other couple we met, they weren't there either. We went back to week four, and neither of those couples were there again. And we started to realize that we weren't going to have a committed family who would actually love us in any meaningful, committed way. And they wouldn't be there for us to even build relationship, to, to build that connection to, that we could actually love and encourage them with this mutual encouragement that we all need as followers of Jesus. Don't we need it? We all only have so much time and so much life energy to invest and to redeem. And so when we say things like, well, as soon as I take care of these things, then I'll get on track and do what the Lord has for me, and then I'll obey what the Bible says. When these exams are over, or when I have my degree, or when I'm through this season of my life, then I'll serve and be faithful with devotion to the church family as Jesus wants, or pray, or give, or whatever else you're putting aside today or tomorrow for your plans. When I finish this or that other thing that's taking up my time, then I'll do what Jesus commands. That's arrogant, James says. It presumes you have tomorrow. It presumes you're going to be healthy. You might, you might not. And it's not doing what you know is right. And that, he says, outright is sin. James is our blunt friend. Right? And he's obedient to do what is right, which is to speak the truth to us in love. As a true and faithful friend, faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? As iron sharpens iron. Obedience to the clear commands of Jesus is our priority today and every day. And we hold our plans for tomorrow with an open hand. See, our flesh will give you all kinds of reasonably sounding excuses to convince our conscience why I can't obey Jesus' priorities and commands today, why they're unreasonable. And James says that is arrogance. It is sinful pride. It's just lawful disobedience to the love of our loving lawgiver. 
So we have to start with the right things that we know Jesus calls us to be doing in the revealed will in the scriptures. But it'll be inconvenient. It'll be costly. Yes, you'll have to die to self. But then comes back the question, what is your life? What is your life? In making decisions, we have to do what's clearly commanded in the scripture to die to self, to love others, to be devoted to gathering with the church family, to not neglect it, to give and receive, to serve, to pray, to encourage, to build up others, esteeming them better than ourselves. I'm called to be in a committed covenant relationship and live out the one another commands of Jesus. And that's why we've designed our gospel communities as we have for that very purpose so that we could be obedient to what Jesus calls us to together in partnership. What about doing a Bible study in addition, right? Well, that might be a good option, but it's, it's not mandated. What about an extra worship night of singing? Great option if you have time and the resources, but, you know, after fulfilling what the scripture directs, what well, a sports league. Great. It's a great means of, of fulfilling the mission, but it, but it doesn't have to be through a sports team. Go see a movie. Have a games night with friends. Yeah, you guessed it. It's extra. It's not commanded. So in regards to these extra things, even good things, you need to know the size of your plate. Right? Even Jesus only had so much time, so much energy, energy. He could only handle so many relationships, so much activity without neglecting what the Father had actually given him to do as his priority. He could only be in one place at one time. And so your plate is, is the size of your capacity. It'd be your, your bandwidth. Now, some of you have a salad plate, right? It's not that big, right? But some of you, you get a large platter with some sideboards, right? You've got a larger bandwidth. But we all have limitations, right? Cheryl and I, we've got very different sized plates. We've got different bandwidths. And she used to feel guilty about not being at everything, right? But we talked about, but what are the scripture priorities, right? What are the non-negotiable that she must do that, that are not optional? And then consider what good things you might be involved in, what extra things, if you're able uh, to have that. That you got to kind of wrestle through with, with the Lord. So Sunday gathering, she's always here because it's what Jesus says is our right priority, right? Our gospel community gatherings and missions, she's there. Everything else is only as she's got the time and energy. Extra prayer groups, Bible studies, book clubs, parachurch groups, as she has the bandwidth and as she works that out with the Lord, as she has room on her plate. And these can be good things, but they're not mandated. Accept the size of your plate and the size of other people's plates, right? If you've got a large platter, don't judge your brother or sister who has a salad plate. All our plates, though, are large enough to do the things that Jesus says are right. The things he commands as our priority will fit on that plate, no matter what size it is. Whether you've got a five-talent plate, a two-talent plate, or a one-talent plate, those things will all fit. Some of you have fear of people issues, right? You want to be liked. You don't want people to reject you. So your plate is stacked high. You're so burdened under it, and things start falling off on the floor. You feel guilty and depressed and anxious because you can't even keep up with your life. Focus on the priorities that Jesus gives you and take some of the other stuff off your plate. I mean, do you really need that third piece of dessert? Right? Don't scrape off the vegetables, right? They need to be there. Well, maybe you can get rid of the Brussels sprouts. Every illustration breaks down, right? But the point is, if it's commanded by Jesus in the scriptures, it needs to be on your plate, and it needs to stay there. So doing what Jesus says is right is not optional. That's not being a legalist. To obey flowing out of a love for God and for other people. But you, need, you might need to let some of your non-commanded darlings go. 
No matter how small your plate, though, devotion to the church gatherings, the people of your gospel community, communing with God and reading your Bible and prayer, serving in some way, making disciples, those all fit on every plate. Then after what Jesus says is our priority, notice he says what our priority is, we ask him and seek his wisdom to discern what else we might be able to handle or what we we can't, right? What we should be doing that we wrestle out with, with our Lord. So verse 17 is clear. Keeping what God tells us is right to do as a non-negotiable is obedience. It's an expression of our love and our faith in a good, good father. It's not legalism. In fact, it's the not keeping of what we're commanded as a priority, he says, is sin, not freedom. It's not being a non-legalist. It's being disobedient. It's actually planning to do what you want, when you want, as if God doesn't exist, as if God doesn't have a say, or as if he hasn't already said. And James is trying to help us, not, not beat us down, right? He's trying to help us see where true life is found. If Jesus has commanded something, you can be guaranteed of this. It's for our good and it's for our flourishing. And it's for the good of others that he loves and wants to love through you. And so he wants us to reorient our plans, live life centered on him who will never fail us or disappoint us. James got to see firsthand how it was the joy of Jesus his older brother, to live in the priority and obedience of his father's will. There was just no disconnect in Jesus' life, right? He didn't fail to do anything his father asked of him. He didn't see his life as his own. And that was Jesus. He's the one person who walked this earth with absolutely no regrets. Jesus had no regrets in yielding his life to what God said is right. Even if the command was to take up his cross for undeserving sinners like you and like me. Even if it meant spending three and a half years discipling with some of the dullest 12 men on the planet, one of whom would betray him. Jesus, before the cross, was tired, hungry, inconvenienced, yet he joyfully and submissively and perfectly did his Father's will, and he did it for our benefit, not his own. What is your life? It's a mist. But if it's in the hand of Jesus, who has stepped in and said, I'll be your life. I'll substitute for you. I'll provide my life for yours so that you can share in my life and then share that with others. What is your life? Colossians 3 gives us an answer to that. Colossians 3 verse 4 says, when Christ who is your life. Isn't that the best thing you heard all day? Especially probably in this sermon. Right? What is your life? a vapor in this present age. But if Jesus is your life, the eternal Son of God, whoa, that's a reason to rejoice and rest. That is security, right? Where my, if the Lord wills, is a great place of security and rest. That's my boast. I'm so glad too that Jesus knew what was to be on the center of his plate where he said, I've come to do my Father's will. I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. All those that the Father has given me, all my lost sheep, they will be brought in. I will lose none of them. He doesn't take us off his plate. Not for a moment. The Father placed us on Jesus' plate And he takes full responsibility for us to the end. Aren't you glad that unlike us, when God makes a plan, it comes to fruition? He does know what today and tomorrow holds, what confidence that gives us, because his life is not a mist. 
He is eternal spirit, unchanging, ever existent, ever present. And the cross was his plan. Jesus knew it was the right thing to do, the will of his father. And as hard as it was to do at times, he did not sin. The book of James, I tell you, without the cross, it's a crushing book. But you bring in the cross of Jesus, that'll change how you, how you view all these things. That will change how you view every command. If you approach him with a business mentality, like a legalist, you will see this is just a burdensome list, a burdensome call to obey. But if you love him, you've seen what he's done for you, it, his commands are not burdensome. His commands become the joy of our heart to which we want to be obedient. And so we see that. And you know what? Jesus knew what he was getting. He was buying on that cross. He's got no buyer's remorse, right? Hey, this one's broken. I don't want him anymore, right? He knows the fools we are. He knows our life is a mist. And so he makes a way and he tells us, I've got you. Yeah, I know that pride crept in again. I know you forgot me, but I've not forgotten you. And that's the remembering that counts above all. On the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or could even be translated, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me? And we know now he was forgotten for us. He received our forgottenness, our being exiled and being cast off. And it was so we could be remembered and never be forgotten. Valued, loved as that important to the Lord of glory. Lord, are you willing to save me? To forgive me? To love me in your grace? He will receive me into his arms and life. Lord willing, Lord willing, and this I know for sure by the unchanging word of the Lord who holds tomorrow in his hands because he, he gives us that word on the cross right up front. He says, I am willing. He is willing.